Sunday. It's great to see everybody today. If you're worshiping with us, we're especially glad you're here. Please let me know if there's anything that you need while you're with us. If you are visiting, you'll find a little clipboard that looks like this somewhere on the end of your pew, and we'd love for you to give us a little information so we can follow up with you know that you're with us today. As we get started, a couple of announcements. Today is brunching following worship, and so I hope you planned on staying afterwards. We will also celebrate Rally Day later on this morning in worship. If you glance at the bulletin, you know that that's coming up. It's a little different than the way we've done it in years past, but I think it's the way we do this year. Thanks to all the men that came out yesterday for our men's group. We had a, a great program from Heather McCarl and from Edwin from Morning Point. It was very informative. Presbyterian women will meet tomorrow, I understand, correct? Yes. 11.30? 1.30. And what chapter is it? Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's 7. I'll have to send out a message on what the homework is. <laughs> we uh, just want to say another thank you for, uh, we continue to enjoy the door dashing. In fact, I think we've decided that we're not even going to put a kitchen in our new house. We're just going to put a kitchen and a phone if this works much better. We are really enjoying it. Jeff Lackey has an announcement for us today. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Oh, okay, good. I'm sure everybody's aware that um, you've seen in the weekly newsletter that we have a scholarship. Fund might be a good way to more on Los Angeles, so I made a request for the session to retain it after her, and I wanted to share with you the reason for my request. Um, Angela's greatest trait was that she always thought of others. Now, I can give you a million examples, but I'll give you one. Uh, she had chemotherapy on Ruby and Ian's last day in New York City. On her way home, um, she told she's not feeling very well, but she insisted we go by and see Ruby and her family. Um, during the two plus hours we were there, um, I knew she was weak, she was nauseous, um, but she was thinking of others as she pondered that the folding stories and calls in prayer. I can't think of a better way to memorialize her than by challenging the scholarship recipient to live by her example and think of others. After all, the greatest commandment we have is not to make. I've provided enough funding so we can interest alone should be enough. Uh, 
Uh, who had a little episode this week at the ER, but I understand he's doing better. We're also praying for Debbie Hansen, who is Sarah Harris's daughter, who's having surgery tomorrow, and so we'll keep her in our prayers for sure. And then I was handed a note that um, the girls, Chloe and Bella's uh, nephew, Jay, I think, is that right? Cooper, it's, Jay is her dad, it's his Cooper, nephew, I see. sorry. Uh, if I could read, I would know what he said. <laughs> Um, Cooper had a dirt bike accident yesterday and has a punctured lung and a broken rib. Two arms are broken. He's in surgery this morning as we speak. So let us send some prayers up for, for Cooper today. Appreciate that. Any other prayer concerns we need to offer today? My friend Laura, prayers for
our sin together in the short certain hope through Jesus Christ, our sin. Merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart, mind, and strength. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been, help us to mend what we are, and direct what we shall be, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Then from John 20, our declaration of heart. Since God has forgiven us in Christ, let us forgive one another. This is the good news. Can see 
see what's inside. It's a viewer. It's a viewer. It's a viewer. The point of this lesson is, is God asks us to be kind. Or we, we talk about God's greatest commandment, right? To love God and to love our neighbors as ourselves. And sometimes it's hard to remember to love ourselves. We sometimes our harshest critic is ourselves. Sometimes we talk when we make a mistake, we say, Oh, I'm so dumb. Whoever ever said that, right? Yeah. We hear that a lot as kids. And you know, um, yes, Marla. <coughs> trying to figure out how you got a picture of my DoorDash delivery guy. So. <laughs> <laughs> Would you stand and join me as we sing together our next hymn number 287. Let us sing.
prepare ourselves to hear God's word read and preached. Would you join me as we pray for the gift of the Holy Spirit as illumination? Indeed, God, you shower us with blessings as we just sang. We're grateful for all the blessings that we enjoy, for our family and friends, as we've been reminded for the love that we enjoy, even love of ourselves. Most of all, we're grateful for your word, for the way that it informs us and comforts us to bless us again in this moment with the gift of the Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Responsive reading today comes from Revelation 21, verses 1 to 3. Would you read it with me? Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. seventh chapter today verses 1 through 18 listen for God's word for you this day in the first year of King Belshazzar of Babylon Daniel had a dream and a vision in his head as he lay in bed and he wrote down the dream I Daniel saw in my vision by night the four winds of heaven stirring up the great sea and four great beasts came up out of the sea different from one another the first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. Then as I watched, its wings were plucked off and it was lifted up from the ground and made to stand on two feet like a human being, and a human mind was given to it. Another beast appeared, a second one, that looked like a bear. It was raised up on one side, had three tusks in its mouth among its teeth, and was told, Arise, devour many bodies. After this, as I watched, another appeared like a leopard. The beast had four wings of a bird on its back and four heads, and dominion was given to it. After this, I saw in a vision by night a fourth beast, terrifying and dreadful and exceedingly strong. It had great and stampeding what was left with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that preceded it. It had ten horns. It was considering the horns when another horn appeared, a little one coming up alone make room for it, three of the earlier horns were plucked up by the roots. There were eyes like human eyes in this horn and a mouth speaking arrogantly. As I watched, thrones were set in place, and an ancient one took his throne. His clothing was white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames, and its wheels were burning fire. A stream of fire issued and flowed out of his presence served him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood attending him. The court sat in judgment, and the books were opened. I watched then because of the noise of the arrogant words that the horn was speaking, and as I watched, the beast was put to death, and its body destroyed and given over to be burned with fire. As for the rest of the beasts, their dominion was taken away, but their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. As I watched in the night visions, I saw one like a human being coming with the clouds of heaven. To him was given dominion and glory and kingship, that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that shall not pass away, and his kingship is one that shall never be destroyed. As for me, Daniel, my spirit was troubled within me, and the visions of my head terrified me. I approached one of the attendants to ask him the truth concerning all this. So he said that he would disclose to me the interpretation of the matter. As for these four great beasts, four kings shall arise out of the earth. But the holy ones of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, forever and ever. This is the word of the Lord. So there was a little 
she asked her mother, what happens to old tractors when they finally stop working? And sighing, her mother answered, someone sells them to your father. <laughs> Full disclosure this morning, I, I think my message today might make more sense to some of our teenagers and young adults in the room than some of our more seasoned citizens, but it's okay, you can listen in. Today we make a significant turn in the book of Daniel. By the way, this is week five in our series. We have one more week and then we'll move back to the cycle, the full cycle of the narrative lecture. For the first four weeks of our series, we've been in the court of the kings. Dreams and interpretations of dreams, threats from the kings and the king's attendants. And each time we've seen the power of God overcome the powers and principalities of the world. Others authority, but God's people only see God as ultimate authority, and that's what saves them. Apocalyptic biblical literature, you know, from the word apocalypse. Sometimes people think of apocalyptic literature as only dealing with the end of the world. What's going to happen when the world ends? What will happen to us and those we love when it all comes crashing down around us? But in the Greek, the word apocalypse actually means to uncover or to reveal. We all develop ways to see the world around us that sometimes hinder us and, and limit our ability to understand the events and the people tomorrow and next week and until then. I like the way Tim Mackey describes it as part of the Bible project. He says, in apocalyptic literature, God pulls back the curtain and it shows someone what's really going on in the world from a divine perspective. It's like a revelation. And of course, you realize that the last book in our Holy Scripture, the one we just read from, has this exact name and is, along with Daniel, another example of apocalyptic biblical literature. In our lesson today, Daniel, the dream interpreter, falls asleep and has a fantastical dream. He becomes a participant in what C.L. Seattle says, he becomes an empathetic visionary, meaning that he not only sees what is happening, but he, he participates in the dream as well. And he is genuinely affected by the terror he experiences. Daniel sees four beasts arising out of the sea. In the ancient Near East, you might know that the sea represented absolute chaos. The beginning of our scriptures in Genesis 1 first verse of creation says, when God began to create the heavens and the earth, the earth was complete chaos, and darkness covered the face of the deep. And so knowing that scripture, Daniel, it would be no surprise to Daniel that these, that these creatures would arise out of the sea, the chaos of the sea. And each of the beasts represented a, a version of ultimate power in his world been lots of ways that these have been interpreted through the years. Some scholars see the powerful kingdoms of Babylon, Media, Persia, and the Greek Empire under Alexander the Great are represented by these beasts. Each of those kingdoms had consecutively dominated the people of Israel over the five centuries prior to when this book was written. Others sometimes see different powers and different rulers depending on what you see there. The point is that ultimate power and dominion over Israel is on the loose, terrorizing and devouring anyone or anything that it comes across with death and destruction. You can see why it's a terrifying vision for Daniel and why he's so overwhelmed with fear and dread as he observes and participates in it. It's kind of like Harry Potter or The Lord of the Rings, or just this summer, Deadpool and Wolverine. And this is the reason that I say my message today might be better understood by teenagers and young adults, because the techniques that are used by Daniel and in similar books like Revelation are the same techniques that are utilized by some of our favorite movies. 
In Harry Potter, it's Lord Voldemort and the Death Eaters. In The Lord of the Rings, Sauron and the Orcs. In Deadpool and Wolverine, it's the Void, where all things are consumed by the creature Alion. It's okay if you have no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> but in all of these movies, which is our modern day equivalent of ancient apocalyptic literature, there is a fantastical and terrorizing threat facing the characters in the story. And notice, by the way, that we don't get hung up on whether or not the characters in the story are real or imaginary, but rather, we identify the threat that they pose in the world and to the survival of not just Israel, but to all of the world, to all people. And that's really important to recognize. Because of what happens next in the story of Daniel, Daniel suddenly sees one like a human being, or in the Aramaic, it would be the son of man, descending from the clouds. And to Daniel, this is a huge relief following all the monsters in the story. Again, turn to a teenager or a young adult for the reference. But this is like the arrival of Harry Potter on the scene with his sidekicks Hermione and Ron. Or Gandalf in the Fellowship of the Ring riding on horseback to the rescue. In Deadpool and Wolverine, the alliance of the world of Marvel and all the heroes promise to save them from destruction. By the way, as a side note, I think our obsession with these movies and our culture is in, way, in some ways directly related to our fear about all of the, the monsters, the dangerous things that we see in our world today. But notice that in all of these stories, the hero of the story or the one that comes to deal with the monsters is some fantastical and otherworldly monster. Magic, or wizards, or elves, dwarves or superheroes with some other superhuman quality, the things that we don't see in our world every day. But in the book of Daniel, it's something different. We are told that the figure descending from the clouds is a human. That's the key to understanding of what makes apocalyptic biblical literature different from other forms that might mimic it or remind us of the genre, but are clearly very different. The figure of God is part of the story too, that point is clear. God deals with us and saves us even in the midst of these beastly terrors, but through human means, in human form. The ancient Hebraic faith where this story first appeared, it was the coming Messiah, or the angel known as the Son of Man. By the time we get to the New Testament, we understand even more. The Son of Man is the person of Jesus. The New Testament is even able to use the passage from Daniel to describe Jesus as the Son of Man coming in the clouds in Mark 13 and 14. Again, we need not wait until the end of time for the coming of Jesus our Savior. Our lesson today proclaims that to him was given dominion and glory and kingship, that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that shall not pass away. His kingship is one that shall never be destroyed. And the last line of our lesson today proclaims, but the holy ones of the Most High, that's all of us, shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, forever and ever. This happens not at the end of the world. When Jesus comes to us, lives and dies, and is raised by God. We who believe have already received the power of the Most High to deal with powers and principalities of our world. Remember, it's not just the end of the world that we're dealing with, but revealing or interpreting the world in which we live today. To pull back the curtain and to show us exactly what is, what's really happening in our world with the events and the people that we see around us. And that's good news in our lesson. When we close our eyes and we dream dreams and see visions Think about the things that terrify us. What are the monsters of our nightmares? Some of them are easy to identify. There's, there still is evil in the world. We've seen their intentions. The terrorists that plan and execute attacks, not on government or military forces, but on innocent people. People who are just going about their day and their routine like we would, and they're suddenly devoured by violence. Death and destruction. It's almost like a monster of sorts. 
even in so-called organized conflicts, meaning armies against armies. I saw on television this week a story about the invention of something called a pedal mine, which is being used in the war between Russia and Ukraine. It's called that because it's an explosive device that represents a bicycle pedal. And thousands, literally, of these are being dropped from aircraft all over Ukraine. Most of them finding their way not on the battlefield, but on the rooftops of the homes, in the yards and gardens of those that are just trying to survive the war. In the story I saw, one man reported that he found 12 of these pedal mines in his garden, missing the 13th which tragically took his leg. The United Nations estimates that over one million mines are currently deployed in Ukraine. Or maybe it's human trafficking or fentanyl that takes our young people or the deadly combination of gun violence and mental illness. Even now there are monsters in our world that are surely threatening to devour us. And they're not fantastical beasts things that terrorize our dreams, those would be easier to deal with. These are just real and terrorizing. Or maybe it's cancer or heart disease or grinding poverty or depression and loneliness. Maybe these are not what we think of when we think of monsters. They are threatening and scary for many of us. But there's good news in Daniel, in Revelation, in Jesus Christ. Our God has seen fit to deal mightily with the monsters of our age, just as God has been doing since the beginning of time. And God deals with those monsters in human form. He's known as Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. In Jesus, all things are possible. In Jesus, there is life, abundance. In Jesus, the body of Christ, known as his people, there is hope. The truth is, we can live without fear because we trust that God has already come to us to deal with our monsters. He's dealt with sin and death in this world. And his remedy was not fantastical or otherworldly, at least not in total. God's truth is in Jesus of Nazareth, he was fully human and fully God. The hope we seek is found in those humans also that follow Jesus. Those that trust in him are called to serve Jesus as he continues to deal with the powers and principalities of our world. That's why we pray each week for peace and for justice. It's why we lend our hands and our hearts to make the world better for all people. It's why Christian men and women serve in our nation's military and in law enforcement. It's why Christians are physicians and nurses and scientists and engineers. It's why Christians lead our children as teachers and coaches. The hope we search for in the midst of terror sometimes can come through humans following Jesus. Today's rally day, the day when we celebrate Christian education, those that teach us and lead us, and those that participate. We want to say thank you. You're also fighting against terror with hope. As together we, we teach and we learn the stories of scripture and we seek in them the answers for what ails us brings us joy. Stories like Daniel are critical for us to know and to learn from. There's something higher than our experiences in this life. God is bringing to fruition the world as God intends it, and it is a world without monsters and death. There are still things that cause us terror. But there are also people and communities like this one that offer hope. It's not our closing hymn today, maybe I should have told Connie, but perhaps captures the sentiment of Daniel in verse. In Luther's A Mighty Fortress Is Our God, it says this in the final verse. The spirit and the gifts are ours, through him who with us sided. Let goods and kindred go, this mortal life also. The body they may kill, God's truth abiding still. His kingdom is forever forever and ever. Thanks be to God. Amen. Friends, would you join me in prayer? Let us pray together. <laughs>
almighty and all-powerful God. In the midst of our terrors, we kneel before you in your throne of mercy in search of hope. You are all power in this world, and we believe that nothing is beyond your reach, nothing is beyond your love. From the very beginning, you have been ordering the waters of chaos, and we continue to trust that you can tame and control the monsters that we still encounter. When we are afraid, O oh God, we pray that you would remind us again of your power, the power we've been given in Jesus our Christ. Our Savior, the one who came so that we need not be afraid. We trust in you, God, for hope. We thank you for all the ways that we've already seen you working in the world. You have brought peace to so many. You've fed the hungry and you've clothed the naked. You've offered healing to those that are sick. You've given comfort to those that mourn. We have hope for the future, in part, God, because we've already seen what you've done in the past. So we thank you for saving us, Lord. We pray for the world around us, for all those that need a reminder that you love them more than they know or deserve. Show us the ways that we might share your gospel with our community so that they might have hope in the midst of what ails them. God, you continue to work through us, through human means, when we answer your call to ministry and when we serve others in your name. For in such ways, we believe, God, you continue to work through humans that are infused and connected with your spirit. It is the spirit of God that continues to fill our hearts and our minds with a peace that surpasses understanding. In you, God, is joy and blessings. And so we pray today using the words that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Continue to worship God with bringing forward of our tithes and our Thank you. gospel, your gospel might spread throughout our community and throughout the world. In Jesus' name. 
Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you please be seated? I know the bulletin says you're supposed to stand, but please be seated. Today we have the opportunity to celebrate Rally Day. It's the beginning of our Sunday school year, another new year, and so I would invite Stephanie to join me up here as the Sunday school superintendent. Super. Um, so I just want to say a big thank you to our teachers who, uh, you know, teach the word of God to our little ones, guide and counsel them, and then also to our teachers that um, guide us through our adult studies. Um, and if anybody's interested in joining, feel free to come. We start at 9 o'clock. Um, Laura's going to be leaving. Um, Bible study starts next week before doing Luke. Uh, and then um, Phil and Seamus leads our adult class. And then I also have thank yous for Susan and Sissy who teach our younger children. Uh, Anna, who is kind of the middle school age kids. And then, yeah, and Seamus and Phil and Laura for our adult classes. So thank you guys. Come see me after. So the opportunity every year of Rally Day is to kind of renew our commitment to Sunday school and to support our teachers. So if you are teaching, if you're one of the ones that Stephanie just called out by name, would you stand, please? Everybody else can continue to sit. Because we'd like to commission our teachers for another year. And there's a liturgy in the bulletin that I would ask that we read together. You'll notice the part that is bold and italic is for the teachers themselves to read. And then just the bold is for the congregation, and all of us will complete that. So let us commission our teachers. God of creation, you have gifted these men and women with teaching skills, creativity, and curiosity. We pray you would fill them with the power of compassion of your Holy Spirit, fill them with energy and insight into your word, the story of your faithful heart. You have not called us to be perfect. You have called us to be faithful. You have not called us to be all knowing. You have called us to believe. We dedicate ourselves to the call and task of wisdom, patience, and joy in our preparation and keeping of your word. God, I love God, each teacher, as they study your word, strengthen the gifts you have given them. And energize their compassion. Remind us to find ways to support and encourage them throughout the year. May we share in their joy in the times of difficulty. We commit and ourselves, each to our heart, in this joyful task. May your steadfast. participating in one of our adult classes. There are two classes that we would love to see you join that can talk to lots of people who are participating. They're, they're great. So let us complete our worship today with the singing of our final hymn number 372. And I will ask you to stand for that. Lord, I want to be a Christian.
fellowship. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord be kind and gracious to you. And the Lord always look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen.